Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, man. So I'm trying to think of a good jumping off point, but basically we're in this this wild world of, of B2B tech. And I think in our pre-chat, one of the interesting things that you covered is the idea of selling into a vertical that has a lot more money than time. And I think that, you know, when I've, when I've sold agency or consulting services to agencies and I've sold video services to the Fortune 500, it always seems like everything comes down, comes down to price. But really, like, there's, there's all these other considerations that are so based on time that are often taken for granted. And there's so much that I think you can do to position a, a certain value proposition or a certain pitch in a way that's fit for people that, that do have money and don't have time. So I, I'll, I'll shut up now, and I'd just love to hear about your experience dealing with that sort of vertical. Yeah, for sure. You know, you hear it a lot, especially recently um, with organizations, you hear budgets are frozen or that I'm having budget cuts. But that doesn't necessarily mean that people aren't still spending money, um, especially at B2B tech companies. I mean, these, these companies aren't just completely shutting off everything. They're, go- they're going to lose to their competitors. If they do, they have investment boards that understand that those investment boards may be a little more frugal with where they're going to spend their money, um, but they need to spend money uh, somewhere. So where are these people going to spend money? What's happening is they're being forced, especially marketers are being forced to do more. Um, I run a podcast uh, called Tech Qualified where we interview marketers um, in B2B tech, generally CMOs. And, and I hear it all the time that they, they're they working more than they ever have historically. They're at home, they're not commuting, um, but they are working longer hours, longer days. And that's because they're trying to make the most out of not having to go you know, outside of house or what have you. So if and when you provide solutions, it's not always the best to lead with like, I can save you money because I don't think where these people are feeling pain is in necessarily their wallets. It's in their time. They've got a lot of times kids at home uh, who may be either not going to daycares or not going to schools yet or what have you. Um, And then on top of that, you pile on more work than ever before because they had to pivot from what their 2020 strategy was going to be into an overnight change and overhaul of either lots of things or everything. Um, And so where you should really be trying to connect with people is – you know, how you can help to alleviate some of that pain and and distress that people are feeling. Right, right. And with that in mind, you know, one thing that you mentioned, uh, you made the point that especially in B2B tech, this is an area where people are savvy. They have sales teams, they have ad dollars, they might have VC money. They don't necessarily need a lot more help breaking into a big account and convincing them to buy. So with that in mind, like what is the value of of an agency? What is the value of like an outside marketing mind? Yeah, I I think that when it comes to providing service to a B2B tech company as an agency. I mean, it really depends on what kind of agency you are. And so I'll just speak to my own experiences. Um, You know, we were a full service agency that was providing every service under the sun from web design to white papers to video assets. And what we, what we launched for ourselves, you know, we, we were struggling to find out what our marketing identity was Uh, for ourselves. And we launched a podcast in 2019 and it really changed my life. Um, I felt like I was doing something that had value that people cared about, that people wanted to listen to versus me putting out, you know, maybe blog posts that were my thoughts. Uh, Now I put out blog posts that are about what I'm hearing in an industry that people actually want to digest and, and, and read and hear about. Um, And then we changed to providing that service to these organizations. And I think, you know, if we go back to that time conversation, what we try to do for our clients is to get the most out of everything that we do. So as an agency, what we're providing is, okay, we're going to record this episode, you know, we're going to record a podcast and we're going to set you up with a podcast. And then that thing is going to do 
10 other things and have all of these branches that come out of it. And so what we're providing as an agency is um, the ability to get a lot out of a little. So if we go back to that time, you know, what I'm trying to provide to people is, hey, spend 30 to 60 minutes recording your podcast, and then I'm going to deliver you a suite of assets that you're going to be able to push out on LinkedIn, Twitter, onto Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You're going to have blog posts that come out of it. Um, So really trying to get the most juice out of your squeeze. Right. I love that. And it's, 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 it's a nice constraint. And I just had a, you know, an interview we're going to be putting out soon with a marketing leader for a big recreational vehicle company, actually. And she made that point. They work with like dozens of agencies. And the main issue is, you know, the ones that they can't work with anymore are the ones that they can't put in the box. The ones that's just like, what can you, what, what can you do for us? Everything, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I love the idea of this one hub kind of branching out to all these other spokes that fulfill so many other, so many other needs. Um, I, I guess to hopefully make your value props stronger, I'd love to bring up the objections people typically have to podcasts, you know, and I think the biggest, one of the biggest ones is, is this a flash in the pan, right? We kind of are seeing this like amazing hundred million dollar valuation for Joe Rogan moment where, you know, podcasts are having all, all this huge meteoric rise. What, what do you say to that? Like, what do you say to the idea that is this just going to go away tomorrow or next month or a year from now? Uh, I say if you're putting out episodes of a podcast with the intention of only having it as a place for listeners uh, and that's your only thing that you're doing with it, then I'd say that that's a pretty decent chance that that could happen. Now, let me take a step back and kind of explain what I'm saying. Um, What I'm saying is that People can find new ways to consume content all the time. Uh, We are firm believers that your podcast should not just be a 30-minute audio that lives on Apple Podcasts. What won't go away are genuine interactions with people in your space. You look at Dan and me right now getting to know each other, have conversations, uh, especially at a time where, you know, Dan and I might, you know, you, you and I, Dan, might, and I'm speaking to the audience, but yeah. you and I might find ourselves meeting at a conference in, in more normal times. Uh, we would probably be attending similar things. That doesn't happen right now. Um, and so the podcast medium has now been this new way for people to get to know each other and establish genuine relationships. That's not going anywhere. Um, and people are finding out that you can do that from the comfort of your home. I don't have to get on an airplane and go fly to Dan or Dan uh, come fly here for us to have uh, you know, a chance to get to know each other. That's not going away. What, el- what also isn't going away is uh, content being – consumed in a variety of ways. So are you turning your podcast into written content that when you have these interviews with people, because people have been interviewing their customers or people in their space forever. Um, And so what podcasts do is you're basically just putting that that interview or that conversation out into the public uh, space, but then you can turn it into all sorts of things like you've always done. Turn that into blog posts, turn that into eBooks, white papers, whatever it may be. Um, and then you also can turn it into video. We're recording this right now. Uh, this, this is going to be turned into video content, which obviously people uh, have consumed for since video has been a thing uh, and, and will continue to consume. So I think the answer is, you know, could podcasts as this sexy new medium that everybody's running to and Joe Rogan's getting paid be something different? Okay, let's just use VR as an example. Let's say VR becomes super easy for the modern man and woman to be able to produce and that becomes the next new thing. Um, Sure, those other things are still going to come along with it. Written, uh, video, uh, audio. So, the idea is that everything that you get out of a podcast isn't going anywhere. No matter what comes up, what goes away, um, doing it the right way, relationship building and creating and repurposing content is going nowhere. 
Right. I love that. It's sort of like, you, you know, you're creating the crude oil that can be refined into airplane fuel or car fuel or, or whatever it is. So that, that makes a lot of sense. So let's say, you know, I'm the CMO of a B2B tech company. I'm sold on the idea of podcasts and this, this applies beyond B2B tech. But I think what we see is lots of hand wringing over what do I focus on? How do I brand it? And I've had this with, with our own podcast, you know, we're called the digital agency growth podcast. We generally stay within the marketing agency space. We have guests on that we could potentially sell to one day. We also have guests on that they're doing interesting things, you know, so like, like tech companies selling to agencies, we have CMOs on. So we've sort of like given ourselves permission to branch out. I've, I've met other people that have successful podcasts. They're pretty much only doing it as a business de- development play. So they're like, we're just going to have on the people we sell to after the fact, we'll say, Hey, if you want to learn more about what we're doing, you know, let's set up a follow-up call. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, assuming people are on board with the idea of starting a podcast, how do you think about branding it? What you, what do you call it? How do you limit yourself? Um, what, what are the areas you're focusing on and not focusing on and then so on from there? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and a lot of people lean into it as a business development tool. And I, I like to tell folks that y- you should really focus on four to five, depending on if you have a partner program, um, types of guests that you're going to have on your podcast. So the first are uh, customers, you know, people who are already your advocates, having conversations with them, people who are your ideal customers. So people who you are not currently working with that you'd like to work with. Uh, Internal subject matter experts. Britt, it is a good chance uh, on your podcast. Lots of especially tech companies and the people that I work with, they have very talented people in-house already. And, you know, I'm sure you you probably know about this as well, Dan, but, you know, you hear it all the time, which is – you know, I try to get the people in house to write for our blog or uh, do things for us. And it's just every time I ask, it's like I'm asking them to do so much. And what we've found is the best way to engage your internal people. And we've literally worked with companies who have told us we've tried for the last five years to get people involved in creating content at our organization. It's impossible. And I say, challenge accepted. And what do we do? Well, we record a 20 to 30 minute conversation with that internal person, turn it into a podcast, and then write a 2,000 word blog post out of that. And all of a sudden, that person who is highly talented, doesn't have a lot of time, doesn't care about content marketing, all of a sudden looks great, has an awesome blog post written uh, either by them or using quotes from them. uh, And all of a sudden, they're very much behind content marketing and they want to do it again. Um, And so it's trying to break down those barriers to make it easier for them to help you create content. So we've got your customers, your ideal customers uh, who, yeah, like you said, you can potentially try and sell to after the fact and break into new accounts and what have you. You've got your internal subject matter experts and you've got your industry influencers, the people who are the big names in your space uh, who, you know, if you reach out to them again, Hey, will you write something for us? You know, will you, uh, I don't know, make a video for us? Maybe, maybe not. Or, hey, I want to highlight you. I want to interview you. I want to make content around you. Um, Those people like to do that. Uh, They like to speak on stage, what have you. It's a good avenue. So we've got customers, ideal customers, internal subject matter experts, um, and your industry influencers. And then the final one, depending on your setup, is if an organization has a partner program, um, it's a really nice touch uh, to engage your partners and get them to come on and speak about what they're doing. Um, you know, I, I have a client who recently was like, yeah, we just brought on this new partner and it's exciting. And there was a press release. So I was like, great. So when are they going to be on the podcast? And the answer was, Oh, I hadn't even thought about that. And, and yeah, yeah, you, yeah, people don't yeah. think about all of the different things that you can get with a podcast. It always seems to be, and you, you talked about, you know, kind of, you didn't use the term ROI, but people are wondering what do they get out of it? And it's like people only see podcasting to this point through very narrow lenses because right. it's new and people don't know about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. And I, I just, it sort of had a forehead slapping moment when you mentioned you know internal subject matter experts because we haven't done enough to get on to get our team on the podcast right and there's we have so many people doing interesting things with with really interesting expertise but it's just so far been me and the and external guests you know so I think that that's like a no brainer win win right there um, and I think you know you make a good point that it's like the podcast sort of just becomes its own force of nature and then creates 
ROI probably in other places like external of it. Um, but, but I guess with that in mind, you know, what is like, is it, is there anything that's measurable? And if so, like, what is, what is reasonable to aim for if you're watching a new podcast? Like what should you be keeping a track of keeping track of? Well, one of my favorites is, you know, people looking at how well the posts are doing, or they think that they should be doing better because they're comparing them to, uh, other, not, not internally, but to uh, other things that they see on LinkedIn. LinkedIn can be a disheartening tool at times. Mm -hmm. There are 20 companies and 20 people, let will just say in marketing who dominate on LinkedIn. And then there are a lot of other people trying to keep up instead of comparing yourself to those other organizations, compare yourself to yourself. If you have a landing page on your site uh, that, or, or posts for blog posts, how, how is your podcast doing compared to those things on social? Is it getting more – are your posts of your podcast getting more views than when you post out uh, a blog post or an announcement? And then you can look at things like, okay, you've got your downloads, you've got your page hits. I mean, that's what you should be looking at. And then there are the unmeasurable things um, that – Unfortunately, I don't have a tool that is going to tell you. I mean, I was on a conversation yesterday uh, with someone who I wasn't selling to who has never liked or reacted or commented on anything that I do on LinkedIn. And he said, you know, Justin, I, I see every day that you post something. It's awesome. Like, I don't know how you're always getting content out, but it's really impressive. I have no data anywhere to tell me that that person is consuming my content, but I know that it's happening. There are so many people who are just um, passive viewers on LinkedIn that it's never going to show up in any report. It's never going to show up anywhere, but you're consistently positioning yourself as a thought leader and people are consuming those things. And that happens to me all the time. Yeah. I'll get a message on LinkedIn. Hey, JB, uh, you're really crushing it. On, you know, I'm seeing you post every day. Keep up the good work. Again, another person who has never liked or commented on anything. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think there is a lot, a lot of these sort of like fooled by randomness dynamics where it's like, okay, I'm going to look at this arbitrary metric and see that it went up or down and then decide that our thing was successful. And then lo and behold, a year later, you get, you know, a new piece of business because they're like, yeah, I heard you on this podcast and, yep. yeah, and it just happens like in these unpredictable ways. So I, I do agree that, um, that, that, you know, way too much time and energy can be spent looking at some spreadsheet that just leads you astray and leads you down a rabbit hole for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I guess one thing that, that I've been thinking a lot about though, and that I know our clients are, and this is in the context of, of people that are selling services, you know, like yourself, probably five, six, seven figures, et cetera. What is a reasonable action? Like, what is that like, to get nerd out and get tactical? Like, what what is that podcast lead magnet? Like, hey, thanks for thanks for listening. Our show is sponsored by our company Acme Agency. If you want to get X, go here. Like, what is what have you seen work in terms of that thing? Yeah, it, it's a good it's a good question. Um, on our podcast, we try to drive people to um, a course on our site um, instead of more. You know. If you're interested in working with us, um, yeah. let us know. Because I don't think that people are coming for that. I think what you're trying to do with the podcast is just get people to have some brand awareness for you. And you need to be doing other things with it. Again, posting it on social. We have um, our, our newsletter. I've never had a newsletter that anyone's ever cared about in my life. I, I've worked. I've worked and owned an agency. I worked in an agency before that, um, and I worked at a, a services company in B two B tech before that. So I've never had. I've thought I had something to say, but nobody ever <laughs> else ever cared that I had something to say. And then I started this podcast, and now I have a newsletter, um, and my newsletter crushes it. It's all text. We have design in house. We like it just being all text. Hey, here are ten episodes that we did. Let us know what you think. We have our biggest download days. We have our, um, we get responses to it. We get recommendations of other speakers that are going to come on. And that's how I know that the podcast is working. Having calls to action of, you know, 
running an ad basically for yourself. We do it just so people continue to hear our name. Um, but again, it's having your priorities in intact. If you want it for business development, use it as a way to break into target accounts, to bring on prospects um, that are within your, you know, your targeted accounts list onto your podcast. Um, and then there's all sorts of things you can do depending on how tactical you want to get. You can run retargeting ads um, of people that you want to be working with back to uh, back to your podcast and getting them to continue to engage with you. I don't think that it is something that somebody is going to listen to your podcast and then at the end of it, sign up to work with you um, or submit a contact form. And I think that that's also a common misconception um, is, you know, well, how am I going to get my leads list from my podcast? Well, that shouldn't be your goal. Your podcast should be helping you to create a bunch of content out, out of it and continue to engage with the people in your space. So you know, I think that there's a, there's a few different answers to that question. Yeah. I, th I think it's sort of uh, the, the hub of the wheel and it, it does, you know, more than the, the sum of its parts, which, which makes a lot of sense um, to shift gears a little bit. One thing we've talked about is the idea of specialization, which is, you know, uh, a, a nonstop topic for, for, for us. And I think lots of agencies are either in the pro specializing or are tired of getting kind of beaten over the head with it. Um, I think that there's there's a lot of hand wringing and fear, you know, uh, along the lines of if we focus on a particular vertical or a particular set of service or, or one service or both, you know, we're going to alienate our legacy clients. So, a little bit about this, I'd love to hear your experience with with specializing. We refuse we refuse to specialize for a long time. Um, for that very reason, we worked with nonprofits, we worked with associations, we worked with tech companies, we worked with healthcare companies, and we've seen two things since we have specialized. The first thing that we've seen since we've specialized is that those legacy accounts haven't gone anywhere. Um, as much as you think that everybody's going to your website all the time, they're not. They're, if they're looking to speak with you, they're going to go in and they're already your customer or you've worked together in the past, they're not going to your website. They're going to go into their email and they're going to type your name or your company and then they're going to send you an email and say they want to work together again, so on and so forth. And if they do go look at your website, you say, yeah, you know, we've, we've tried to hone in on this one vertical where we've done really well. Um, but we have not, not one client in those other spaces has even asked us about our rebrand um, that's been launched uh, since we decided to really lean into B2B tech uh, as our space um, at the beginning of 2020. Uh, I don't think I've had one of those legacy clients come to me and say, hey, Justin, you know, are you still working with associations or you, you know, are you, do you still want to work with us? And I'm like, of course I do. Um, we haven't stopped offering the services that, that, you know, you're looking for. Um, and we've done good work in the past. They're not going to change because of that reason. Now, what I have seen, um, and what I mentioned a little bit was I, I never had anything to say that people cared about because I wasn't in a space. Nobody cares about what your broad agency has to say. I, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings with that, but it, people want to know about people. They want to hear from people who have um, expertise in their space. And look, I, I provided services to people all over the spectrum in terms of uh, their, their industry. And I used to find it frustrating when, when people would be like, uh, you know, I would send over a proposal with some samples in it and they'd be like, well, do you have anything specifically in like uh, mechanical engineering when it comes to the automobile industry? And I'm like, oh, sh you know, sh shut up. <laughs> this this yeah. should work. Uh, it's close enough or you're asking for this type of thing and it's not your space, but I'm literally going to do almost this exact same campaign. Why I don't have anything in your space. And what I found now is that's so easy for me. Because everyone I'm going after is all in the same general space. You know, there's B2B tech is still extremely broad and we're narrowing that even more to working with small marketing teams of one to five in B2B tech, which oh. sound, which 
if you if I told that to myself of two years ago, I would think that's nuts. But what I find super interesting is that now you get the uh, a different objection, which is a complete catch twenty two. And the, the objection that we get is, well, you know, are you going to work with my competitors? And then the answer is, you know, for what we're doing, every campaign siloed from every other. If we get somebody a meeting, it's theirs to keep. It's 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 somebody that wants to talk to them specifically. Uh, but beyond that, but but the main thing is like you know, well, which is it? Do you want us to have experience in your field or do you want us to never work with your competitors? It's, it's one or the other. <laughs> so I'm curious, like how often does that come up in your space and how do you deal with it? Well, like I said, um, we're broad enough that I, I haven't run into that situation. And, you know, I, I think that I provide a service that isn't – as tactical, I think, as probably what you right. may have to deal with. Uh, look, if I'm going to make three podcasts in the same space, uh, I mean, it would be interesting. And, and uh, I'd have to figure out how to tackle that. Um, but yeah, you know, we're still broad enough that, that you know, our, um, our TAM is, is, is big enough that if that happened, maybe I do miss out on the opportunity, but there's still, there's so many businesses in the U S for me to sell to that. Um, that's some, that's a risk I'm willing to take. And, and I like that risk yeah. much more than what I was doing before. And, you know, now I have something to say and I'm in a space where people care about my voice. Um, and, and that is a big differentiator. Um, if I just go back quickly to, me launching um, our podcast, you know, I was at a point where I was not bored with what I was doing, but I wasn't inspired. And now I'm in, I've niched down, I'm in a space, I know the people in that space, I know the influencers, they know me, I've had them on on my podcast, we speak, and I'm sure that um, people at agencies feel this way, because I've felt that way, which is that you're not peers with the people that you sell to and by niching down and getting a focus in an industry uh i am peers i have cmos on who i've looked up to for years who come on to my podcast and talk to me and we are equals and they're cur they're as curious about what i've heard as i'm curious about their expertise and they want to know, hey, you know, I know you've talked to this person and that person. I'm curious what they said to me. And we are just equals and peers. And it took a long time for me to get to this point. And it has been very eye-opening uh, for me. And it's, it's been life-changing to niche down and, and really find a home. Right, right. And what I find is that the, through the process of, of niching, like there's still things that I learned about the agency space that, that surprise me every day. And it's, I, and I've been at this for a better part of the a better part of a decade. So, you know, that's why I'm super skeptical of, of bouncing around between lots of different areas. So I, I'd love to put that question on you. Like what, what are you, what are you continuing to learn about your industry? That's, that's new to you, if anything. A, a lot, you know, for, for me, um, I, I know I keep saying podcast, but it's because it's the best way to connect with people, um, especially right now. And I, I've interviewed north of 50 CMOs, myself, my business partner, probably another 25 um, since the pandemic hit. And so we, I've, I, I was having conversations with people uh, as it was, as you know, it was new. And then I was literally mid record on an episode when uh, a company's sent out an email saying everybody needs to leave the the office now i've watched how businesses have shifted from having 100 to 500 people coming to an office every day to going fully remote i've talked to organizations that are the organizations that are making that happen who you know they empower remote workforces and i've had them on to talk about so what I've experienced is that I get a, a real pulse on my space at all times by having this kind of media ability to almost report on my space. Um, and, and that has been, I mean, it's been, it's been wild over the last five to six months. Um, yeah. And the way that podcasts have played out, I'm going to get kind of conceptual, but there's a great, you know, Nassim Taleb uh, observation where he talks about just innovations. And one of them is the like a roller duffel, right? Like we had 
you know, we had uh, uh, suitcases, we had bags for millennia. We had the wheel since the beginning of time, but it wasn't until like whatever, 60s, 70s, 80s, that somebody thought to put a wheel on a bag. And now you don't have to carry this bag through an airport and it's this huge innovation. I feel like podcasts are a little bit like that where we had the internet for a long time and we had, you know, human communication through voice since the beginning of time. That's how stories were told. That's how we communicated until the printing press, which was pretty recently in the grand scheme of things. So it's only now that we've sort of been able to like channel the original form of communication, the original medium, you know, through the internet. So that's why I love, you know, what, what you guys are doing and the idea of like, you know, that huge objection, like we can never get people internally to create content for us. And it's like, Oh, the whole, the whole time it was just a problem with writing. Like writing is kind of this weird specialized thing that like not very many people are good at, you know, and it's hard. Uh, and all we had to do was just switch the medium and now it's relatively easy for people to communicate. Totally agree with all of that. And, you know, just like you said, and, and the way that I like to put it to people is, you know, how long have you been, had the ability to record phone calls and, you know, it's 20 years and all a lot of these podcasts are, are just recorded meetings. I mean, that's what it, that's what it is. Um, the amount of times I'm in a meeting that I'm, and because I now live in this space that I'm thinking, man, this would have been a good episode. Um, because Pete, what you don't realize is that in your meetings, and I'm not telling you to go share all your secrets, but in your meetings, you're talking about your space. You're solving problems in your space in real time. And other people would have loved to have heard what it is that you're saying. And you can get your internal subject matter experts into meetings all the time. Um, that's not the issue. They have to, and you hear it all the time. Now I'm in more meetings than I've ever been in. Um, so people are getting comfortable with doing that. And all you're doing is then using it as, uh, a, as a piece of content. And it's really simplifying, uh, the content creation process for an organization like mine or yours or any agency that's out there. Um, instead of saying, Hey, can you get someone to write something for me? And they're like, I mean, you might as well ask them to climb Everest. You're like getting our CEO to sit down for three hours and write something that he or she is proud of, because there's also that that goes into it as well, which is it's not just them writing it. For, the, for it to go out, they need to feel like they're, they're going to want research. It may not even take three hours. It may take 10 hours. It may take a quarter. I don't know. Um, versus just having a 30 minute conversation with your CEO where he or she is saying the things that they always say. And then when you write it out of what you recorded from them saying, they're like, this is, this is awesome. I said this, I said all this, this is great. Um, and then they're inspired to produce content, which I'm sure lots of people hear all the time as well, which is getting people involved in the content creation process is hand wringing. It's like, please, please get involved. And people are like, oh, here's yeah. marketing again. Right. And it's like, in addition to everything else that I have to do for you, you're asking me to take time out of my life to go write articles. Isn't that like, what your job is? Yeah. Versus a podcast where it's kind of like, oh, well, we're doing meetings all the time anyway. So we're kind of just going to, you know, make this a little more formal and recorded and so on. And then it'll be done. Um, you touched on something really interesting and an objection that comes up, I think a lot, especially for bigger agencies doing big, the fear of sharing secrets, right? This idea that we have the secret sauce and some client's going to be pissed if we share it. And obviously there's, there's some real things to keep an eye out for, you know, if you're under particular NDAs or something like that. But I, usually I find that this fear is like completely overblown and that, there's so much opportunity that's being neglected because there's these big agencies that have done such amazing work, but unless it's like a really vague case study sitting on some hard drive that they share three times a year, they're really not getting those stories out to the world and out to people that could potentially hire them in any sort of meaningful detail. So I'd just love to hear like how much you agree, disagree on that and how you feel about, you know, this, this sort of like NDA, NDA addiction basically. Yeah. Uh, and so on. Well, I, I believe for the most part, you're going to want to ungate almost everything. You're going to want, you want people to view you as a thought leader. Um, here's what I could say to that a little bit. I mean, the, the bigger and badder that you are as an organization, 
the more you can gate, the more you can hide because people know you're, you're big time. Um, if you take a company like Salesforce, maybe they don't want to give out all their secrets because they, and even though they are, and they have tons of content that's out there, but they're not fighting for dem demonstrable expertise. People know that they're the big dog. Um, now, if you're a small company, who's a CRM company, who's trying to get your foot on the map and you feel like you're a little bit different and you think I'm not going to tell my secrets, Nobody is going to believe you that you're, that you're going to put up a fight to Salesforce. You need to show people what you're thinking and how you've arrived at things and know that what you provide as a business, someone can't just take your idea and replicate it. And if they can, then maybe your idea isn't that good. It's, it's that simple. <laughs> if somebody can listen to a 20-minute podcast – or read a white paper or um, read a blog post and steal your business from that, then maybe you need to rethink your business well, because yeah, I just don't believe that the amount of work that goes into what you've done as an organization is that simple that somebody can just take it. I'll tell everybody how I produce podcasts, what tools I use, uh, how we get guests. I'll tell yeah. you everything. And I believe that no one will be able to do it the way that I do it because there, I've put in the sweat equity, the time, the effort, the energy to get to this point. So right. I want people to know that. I want people to know what I've done, what I've found, how I found it, and then to say, man, I want to work with you because of that. Because I'm not Salesforce. People don't know. I'm not a household name. So I need to earn it. And the way I earn it is by telling as much as I can, trying to empower and educate. And then hopefully people say, well, you know what? This information is great. And now I want to work with you. Right. Exactly. And also, you know, both of us are in a service business that's constantly changing and emerging. So, you know, we get lots of questions on the tools that we're using and we're like, yeah, we'll tell you It'll probably be something different tomorrow, you know, based on what we're finding to work well. So, uh, so that, that makes a lot, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess like, I remember being in sort of more of like a tech focused area, probably like 10 or 15 years ago before I started this company now. And the number of, of NDA requests I would get to sign we're, we're just massive. And I think that's like a good measure of how much people are, are, are come around to the way of thinking that you've just described. Have you seen the, the NDAs you're forced to sign go up, go down, remain static? Like what does that, how, how does that look to you? Yeah. Well, since pivoting to B2B tech, I, I haven't seen nearly as many NDAs as I saw with nonprofits and government type entities or government contractors. You're from the yep. DC area as am I, you know, right. I've worked with, tons of organizations. We've got cyber companies out here and I get it. Um, but a lot of times, and one of the reasons that I have pivoted to the space that I'm in is that these people get marketing. They, they get modern content marketing, which is you need to educate your buyers. They, they need to they need to read your content, listen to your content, watch your content and get more educated on what you offer. And if you provide them, I, literally, if somebody came to me and said, Justin, I want to start a podcast and I don't want to pay you for it and I want to start it myself, I would tell them every single tool that I use. And that's the way a lot of my clients are. And that's the way a lot of people in marketing and B2B tech, selfishly, because it's my space, I think that they're some of the smartest and brightest marketers out there, um, that, that, that they feel that way. Everybody's out there trying to help each other. I'm in a... Um, Slack group called Rev Genius, where nobody's allowed, it's all revenue driving individuals. Um, so you've got marketing, sales, and rev ops, um, and nobody's allowed to sell in there. We sure we may sell to each other on the sides, and that's how we get to know each other and meet each other, but everybody's in there just helping each other and trying to educate each other. And if I can help someone to stand up a podcast with my education and just saying, This is how you do it and they have a good experience, they're going to tell people that I did that. And that's how they all operate too. I see it all the time. People are educating each other on ways to not even have to use my technology or have to use my services uh, because that's where content marketing is heading. And so the answer is, is 
Do I still see NDAs? Of course. Um, in my space, they're not very prevalent um, unless I'm right. working with a more secure type company. Yeah, yeah. And one thing that you kind of touched on there that I'm thinking a lot about these days is we've both kind of verticalized. So, you know, we're, we're focused on agencies. You guys are focused on B2B tech. So one thing we've, we've started doing recently is going wider in terms of what what we offer. You know, if we're a Bass Pro shop, we're not just going to sell fishing poles. We might also sell white water rafting gear or something like that because we've decided not to sell whatever else, you know? So for us, that's meant educational materials, courses people can purchase. Like if basically the, the whole value chain, you know, if an agency is not ready to bring us on full time, then there's a course or some other offering a training program that can help them do in house, you know, what they would hire us to do to some extent. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Is that something you guys have thought about? Are there other things you guys are doing in the B2B tech space, you know, for, for different people, different stages and so on? Well, it's funny. We, we went the, so we went the opposite direction and I'm not saying that the direction that you went is wrong because I, I also like the idea of being able to provide courses and different service offerings and what have you. We and our, our sales approach and, and just approach as an organization is we did offer everything. White paper, sure, website redesign, uh, video, what, what have you. Um, whatever it is, we can do it. Um, and we found that to be a very difficult sales process for us. And, and again, I know that's not what you're offering, but this was our, our journey. And what we've done is we've gone the other direction, which is to productize a service, which is our podcast. We believe that this podcast is the most fundamental piece of your content marketing strategy. So it's an umbrella to everything else that you're going to be doing. And what we end up doing is we get in through the podcast and we still have all of the tools in house. I didn't lay people off because we are moving to podcasts. I still have all the same people. They're doing different jobs or the same jobs, but we're just not marketing ourselves that way. And so what we're doing is we have one in and our one in is the podcast. And once we're in, we start to get a lay of the land within these organizations and where we can help. Great example. We landed, a, we landed a customer, we worked with them for 90 days, we got their podcast launched, and their website uh, was on a platform that we didn't really, that didn't look the best. Um, and so, you know, we're like, hey, we can migrate you over to WordPress and uh, do, a, it doesn't need to be a complete website overhaul, but a redesign. And they were like, that's great. You know, how much is that going to cost? And we're like, you know, here's what the pricing is. Here's what we can do. And they're like, this is fantastic. We'd love to do that with you. We are now more ingrained as a partner. We're now their web partner or their web design partner, uh, as well as their podcast partner. And by being your podcast partner, I'm also really your entire content marketing. Uh, so you, you, we come in through a very narrow uh, angle and then branch out once we get in with a lot of different service offerings. So that's been... That's been our approach. I'm not saying it's the right approach, but for us, it makes our sales process easier because I'm not yeah. saying, you know, um, what do you want? I'm selling it. I'm like, this is what I'm selling. Do you want that? And they're like, yes, I do want that. And then I get to really identify land and expand kind of situation. Right. I love that. So there's so many great metaphors here. Yeah. I think that it's kind of the tip of the spear idea. And uh, I think that that's, that could be a natural fit for a lot of our listeners um, who are trying to figure out the right way to specialize and, and position themselves as kind of finding that, that one service that branches out to, to everything else. So, and it goes back is, to, yeah. and, and it goes back to fear, Dan. Yeah. I, I think it goes back. People are afraid to say that, I don't service this industry. People are afraid to say that I don't do this job. And what ends up happening is that you, if you do everything for everybody, you're not a fit for anybody. Yeah. And it takes a lot of uh, discipline and courage. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been tested there. I think early in the early days, we wavered too much and we took on projects that were outside of our core competency of the agency world. And just two weeks ago, I had somebody come across my plate a referral, you know, it was a giant uh, nonprofit organization. And I seriously thought about it. It took putting time into the equation, like waking up the next morning and saying, you're like, nah, we can't, we can't take this on. It's, it's, it's too far off course. So I, I, I got an, point. I got an inbound recently from 
an extremely recognizable brand. Uh, they're not Salesforce, they're not HubSpot, but something along those lines um, of, of you being able to recognize the company name. And I, I told them, you're not a fit for what we're doing. We work with mar small marketing teams of one to five people. You are B2B tech, but it's just not really what we do. And I'd rather save you the time, save me the time than going down. There was going to be a presentation to the marketing team. Then there was going to be a presentation to the CMO. There was going to be a presentation to the board. I thought we could give it a run. I didn't think we were going to win it is one. I didn't think we were going to win it because there's going to be someone who works with those types of companies who's going to be able to say, hey, here's our portfolio of us working with you know, a billion dollar organization, yeah. um, that, so I didn't think we were going to win it. And, and, and the time that it was going to take was going to be immense. And I just said, look, I looked at my ICP. This isn't in it. This isn't what we're going after. And I'm just going to save myself the energy. And that is something I never would have done. Uh, every opportunity that came in, every contact form that came in, I had the mental, when we offered everything to everybody, it was, I'm going to fight tooth and nail for every single thing. And now I know, I'm like, let's just stay focused on the direction that we're going. And I'm not saying you don't go after things that are outside of your space, but it is nice to know what your wheelhouse is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, uh, it's a Derek Sivers, you know, it's either a hell yes or no kind of situation. Mm -hmm. It takes, it takes uh, t time to build that muscle for sure. So it makes sense. Just, Justin, this was awesome, man. Uh, how can people get in touch with you? Yeah. So you can find me, um, on LinkedIn, uh, that's, uh, LinkedIn backslash, uh, Justin Brown motion. Um, you can, uh, find our website motionagency.io, and those will be the best ways to, to get in touch. Awesome, man. Thanks so much for your time. All righty. Thanks, Dan.